Hello everyone, welcome to your Friday edition of Eye on Africa. These are the headlines. The policeman killed in yesterday's terror attack in Tunis was buried today. Meanwhile, the country's presidency says the health of Beji Kaid Asepsi is improving after the 92-year-old suffered a, quote, severe health crisis. Another day of football at the Africa Cup of Nations, Tunisia keeps its hopes of qualifying for the next round alive, while Morocco clinches a ticket for the knockout stages. And our team in the Ivory Coast explores the pangolin trade. The trade is banned under international law, but the animal is prized both locally for its meat and in East Asia for the supposed medicinal properties of its scales. We'll have that report coming up a little later. Tunisia has held a funeral for the policeman who was the sole victim of yesterday's suicide bombing in Tunis. Eight other people were injured. The so-called Islamic State group later claimed responsibility for the attack. Meanwhile, the Tunisian president has said that President Beji Kaid Asepsi is steadily recovering after suffering, quote, a severe health crisis yesterday. Several media reports even claim the 92-year-old had died before the Tunisian government denied the rumors and asked people to stop spreading false information. Those pictures, of course, from that funeral of the policeman. France 24's Catherine Norris Trent is in Tunisia. She has more from the capital. There were very emotional scenes on the streets of the suburb of Tunis where that funeral took place for the police officer killed in one of uh, Thursday's twin suicide bomb attacks in the capital. A crowd of a few hundred people uh, carried the coffin of this young police officer, we believe aged uh, 24. They carried that high throughout the streets and there was tears in the eyes of several of those mourners and also there was defiance there among the crowd, people telling us that they were determined to come out, that terrorism would not break Tunisia and that terrorism had no place in this country. Uh, fellow police officers from that area where the officer had lived as well saying that they were strong and they were going to show national solidarity. So a mood of defiance but there's also life returning to the streets of the centre of Tunis. As you can see around me, there are many people out now having an evening stroll. Now the heat of the day uh, is dying down. People here flocking out to the cafes and the streets of Avenue Bourguiba, uh, just a few hundred metres from one of those suicide attacks, where one of those attacks took place. And people here saying life has to carry on as normal, and they are really hoping and praying that these latest attacks in Tunisia will not blight the future of their country. We've had several officials coming out ever since President Asipsi was hospitalised, denying rumours that he had in fact passed on. They've been out again today. We had one of his advisers speaking to Tunisian public radio saying the president is getting better. In fact, he'd been speaking with the defence minister and saying that he should be leaving hospital shortly. So we'll have to keep our eyes out for any more uh, glimpses of the state of the president's health. Uh, but the officials in Tunisia are working hard to deny any reports of a power vacuum, saying that the president, yes, is an old man, he's aged 92, but that he is still in charge of the country and there is no power vacuum. Time for some football now. Morocco has qualified for the round of 16 in the Africa Cup of Nations after beating the Ivory Coast 1-0. That win thanks to a goal by Youssef and Nesri at the 23rd minute. Morocco is at the top of their group with six points. The Ivory Coast is second with three points. Their neighbors did not do uh, too well, the neighbors in North Africa. Tunisia got very close to a disastrous loss against Mali today, but thanks to a 70th-minute goal by Wehbi Khazri, the Pharaohs have kept their hopes of a knockout round qualification alive. The final score was one all, and Tunisia is now in second place in Group E behind Mali. Here are some of the mixed reactions from Tunis. Very disappointing. We played badly. We're really disappointed. We're happy to have left with a draw considering the performance. That's football. It's better than a loss because we were one goal down, but we managed to get one back. It's a shame we didn't get a second. That would have been perfect. It would have been a relief for us going into the next game. We found ourselves in a very tight group in the end. And a reminder that Namibia will take on South Africa in just about uh, 10 minutes at the Al Salam Stadium in Cairo. Both teams are at the bottom of Group D, having lost their respective opening games. 
Algerians have taken to the streets once again for the 19th consecutive Friday of demonstrations. Despite heavy police presence in Algiers, there were several thousands of protesters who called for a transition to a civilian-led government. Among the police forces' targets this Friday, Berber flags and displays of Berber nationalism. This comes after the head of the army and de facto leader Ahmed Gait Saleh said last week that Berber flags would not be tolerated during demonstrations. Uber wants to conquer more of West Africa. The online car service is already well implemented in East African countries as well as Nigeria and Ghana. And now Uber is holding talks with authorities in Senegal and the Ivory Coast. But across Africa, as in other parts of the world, it hasn't always been smooth sailing for the company. Many drivers have gone on strike against rates they say are too low. Mo Julien has more. Always drive the speed limits. You know what the speed limits Training to become a Uber driver in Lagos. 36,000 African drivers already work for the San Francisco-based platform, and it's just the beginning. As well as increasing its pool of drivers in Nigeria, the company wants to conquer Senegal and Ivory Coast. We're having discussions in Senegal and Dakar, big cities with great opportunity. And, um, and so both Abidjan and Dakar are logical. Uber is an attractive choice for drivers with no capital to start off with. The company helps them secure a loan, provided they work for the platform until it is reimbursed. It seems like a win-win, but drivers in Kenya and Nigeria have repeatedly gone on strike, claiming passenger fares are too low for them to make ends meet. Uber insists its economics make sense and has even launched a cheaper ride-hail service, Uber Go, in Kenya. The company is also looking to diversify its offer and has its eye on public transport in Nigeria. We're looking at, of course, the waterways here, which are very interesting to us as it relates to, you know, potential service that may include the great geography uh, that you have here. Um, we spent yesterday meeting with a bus company, uh, Lagos Bus Company, to think about what we could do with buses. The company has already launched a boat service in Mumbai, and it's not surprising that Lagos is next on the list. Nigeria is Africa's first economy and set to become the third most populated country in the world by 2050. Finally tonight, we're taking you to the Ivory Coast to meet the most poached mammal on the planet, the pangolin. Trade in pangolins is banned under international law, of which Ivory Coast is a signatory, but the animal is prized both locally for its meat and in East Asia for the supposed medicinal properties of its scales, making it one of the most lucrative species for poachers. And across Africa, trade is booming. Thais Brook and Frank Hersey have this report. Banco Park, a unique inner-city patch of primary rainforest, increasingly hemmed in by Abidjan, Ivory Coast's main city. Here, you'll still find a few specimens of an animal that remains a mystery to most, the pangolin. Hunted for both its meat and scales, the pangolin has become the most poached mammal in the world. Ivorian authorities are making an increasing number of pangolin-related seizures. It's estimated to be uh, actually combined with that one over there, 3.6 metric tons of exclusively scales. It was uh, seized from a group of traffickers here in Cote d'Ivoire that were hoping to ship it uh, off to Asia. That's about 10 to 15,000 pangolins. The scales are used in traditional Chinese medicine, notably in China and Vietnam. Yet they're simply made of keratin, like our fingernails. Here, the scales are being sorted by species, and the conservationists involved are highly concerned about increasing levels of trafficking. We've gone from local consumption of pangolin meat uh, with the occasional hunting and things like that to a massive quantity of export of a very targeted product from Africa to Asia, and that's the scales. Trade in pangolins has been banned since 2016, but few in Ivory Coast are aware of the law. The NGO Vision Vert runs regular awareness raising workshops among communities living in national parks, where pangolin is a favorite dish. Did you know the pangolin is disappearing? It's disappearing. That's right. There won't be any more. Because here my plates of pangolin go for 2,000 francs. It's very, very tasty. Habits die hard, but volunteers are convinced that mindsets are changing. And sometimes they're pleasantly surprised. After we do workshops, we leave our numbers and contacts, and people call us back as soon as they come across live pangolins to hand over to us for free for us to release. As was the case for this young pangolin. 
nursed back to health by an individual, the NGO was then able to release her, hoping she'll evade poachers and find a mate. That does it for this edition of Eye on Africa. Chris Moore will be here in just a few minutes for a brand new hour of Life from Paris and, of course, the very latest on that uh, France versus USA game in the Women's World Cup. Stay tuned.